Okay, so what we're going to talk about is vitreo macular traction and the role of some new therapies. And until the onset of OCT, there was probably not a huge amount of differentiation for us optometrists in terms of the etiology of macular holes. But OCT, for those of you who've had it, it's revolutionized both the management and the diagnosis of it because you're now seeing things that you never saw before. And in fact, whereas we used to think that things like epiretinal membranes, macular holes, vitro macular traction were actually abnormal, what we now realize is for the vitreous face to come away cleanly and leave a perfectly normal fovea, that's the abnormal. Um, there are so many people out there with unusual things. So the vitreous, from being something that we kind of couldn't even see and didn't bother about uh, some years ago, it's now become quite an important aspect in terms of quality of life in certain conditions. Stages of macular hole. We've got stage one, known as a foveal detachment. You get a new macular hole. Sometimes it appears a little yellow cyst. Up to about 50% will develop, 50% will um, spontaneously resolve. You might get a drop in vision, you might not. It's typically around about 100 to 200 microns across and it flattens the foveal depression. Second stage, stage two, known as a full thickness macular hole, begins to take on a more oval crescent or horseshoe shape and up to 70% of these will progress to stage three. VA has by now probably begun to decrease. You may or may not get metamorphopsia with it becoming distorted or blurry. Stage three, full thickness, it's defined by a rim or a cutoff. Visual acuity is markedly reduced. Stage four is basically similar to stage three, but at this, in this occasion, you've got a complete PVD. The whole PVD has come away. We'll look at some symptoms and diagnosis. So blurred vision is obviously one, metamorphopsia is another, and you can get this severe decrease in VA, but you know, down to say 360 or something of that nature. And then accompanying photopsias similar to your flashing lights in a PVD. You may get slow and progressive loss. You get these chronic traction effects. And I think what we need to be careful about here is we start to be a little bit more precise on the wording. So you'll hear me flip from VMA to VMT. Vitreomacular adhesion is where you've got the posterior hyaloid face of the vitreous attached to the retina, and it may or may not be altering the anatomical shape visible on the OCT. Traction is where it is pulling at it to the point where it creates symptoms of reduced or changed vision. If you leave the vitreomacular adhesion, visual acuity will decrease two or more lines during the follow-up period of three years in about 12, 30% of eyes of the stage one, 68% of eyes of the stage two, and 27 of 40 eyes of the stage one lesion with PVD to the macula initially, nine will develop a full thickness macular hole, in case that's a third. 64% have a two line drop over 60 months. 32% will have a more than six line drop, okay? So quite, quite high numbers can have, have a problem. A number of them will also stay the same or improve over a period of time. What's the current standard of care? Well, it's really observation until visual symptoms justify any intervention. So the treatment that's been available up until now is vitrectomy surgery. Here we are, we have vitreomacular adhesion with vitreomacular traction, possible macular hole. What do you do? You do a vitrectomy. These new pharmacological treatments, they might offer an alternative strategy to watching waiting. They might offer an alternative strategy to surgery. And this is where we bring in this substance called ocriplasmin. It's used in conventional clean room facilities a bit like you'd inject for Lucentis. So it's not done in operating theater. And you inject it into the vitreous. And what it does is it cleaves the peptide bonds that are the adhesion lines, the source of tension uh, within the vitreous against the retinal face. So the primary endpoint is have we got resolution of the vitreomacular adhesion at 28 days by pharmacology? So let's do some studies on that. Good numbers, 652 patients with focal VMA, randomized to placebo intravitreal injection or ocriplasmin. What happened is we get 10 patients resolve on their own in the placebo group. Two and a half times that number of patients resolve in the treated group. So here's an example. Baseline, VA of 2050. Day 7, 2050 VA, but it's looking a lot better. Day 14, then the, the separation's gone. Um, by day 28 and month 3 and month 6, uh, there's no evidence of any posterior hyaloid face at all. What are we going to do in primary care as optometrists? How are we going to manage this? Well, number one, it depends a bit on your diagnostic abilities. And your diagnostic abilities for something that it can only be seen in cross-section with an OCT would rather seem to depend on technology. The other thing is, what's the incidence in our patients coming through the door? What's the real prevalence of these problems? Because if you have been using an OCT for the last five or six years, you know that there are a lot more people with cellophane maculopathy, with epiretinal membranes, with vitreous floater problems than you ever thought possible before. 
So let's just have a think about what's our standard of care for vitreo macular uh, disease. Okay, well, you're going to measure VA, hopefully. Amsler, you know, it's a crude test in as much as if you can see distortion, it's successful, and if you can't, the test didn't work. Dilation, Watsky allen test, people familiar with that? This is your Volk lens uh, with a very, very, very narrow slit, and you run the very narrow slit across the macular hole. In a macular hole, you'll get, a, you get a, an abrupt gap. So where do we go in optometry? Well, in routine sight tests, you are unlikely to pick up any symptom-free vitreomacular adhesion. If you're offering extended examinations and you're doing OCT on a lot of your patients coming through the door, then you will pick up symptom-free VMA and you, it's your choice whether to monitor or refer it. And let's have a quick look at what we're actually seeing in practice. So we've got somebody first vitreomacular adhesion observed in uh, January 14, a, a slight drop in VA, and that's what it actually looked like on the day we're seeing her. And we've got previous OCT scans that show that that's not there. That's when it was first observed. My decision was because the VA was not markedly affected, um, was to look at, at three months and look for distortion or Amsler or get her to come back in if she picked up distortion. And we saw her at three months and that's what she got, a little bit of distortion. So the, you can see the April one on the bottom left and the January one in the, in the middle there. Um, they don't look too different, but one of them she's perceptive of distortion, the other one she isn't. Um, we have an informal uh, link through our email system to our local medical retina guy, and so he's actually um, gone ahead and arranged to see her. Uh, she was going to go ahead and have that done. So she was going to go for the ocuplasma injection. I haven't seen her since. There you can see it just touching, and there again in the April. You'll see there's a difference between the January and the April one. You see whether the, the tissue's actually got a little bit more dark gaps in it. So there's no system here. We don't have anything that is, is kind of giving us really a huge amount of confidence other than the personal nature of the referral between the medical retina guy and ourselves. These tests were not funded uh, other than by the patient um, and then our local CCG at that time was not funding ocuplasma so that's being done privately as well. Mm -hmm.